This is off planet radio. Hey, welcome once again to Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins. The website is offplanetradio.com. Jeez, it's been so long since I did this. Um, yeah, offplanetradio.com, our YouTube channel, and um, patreon.com forward slash offplanetmedia are the web addresses. And um, this show comes with a couple of provisos. A, this is not safe for work. This is not family fa- friendly and trigger warnings are in place. We're gonna talk about some things tonight that uh, go into deep programming aspects of sexuality, gender, and um, I guess the androgynous, the transgender thing that's going on. We're gonna cover a lot of turf on it. It kind of grows out of a conversation that Shane and I had and Emily and Shane and I have had. We've all had this conversation and uh, all three of us agreed we wanted to put it out. So I welcome first my co-host, Emily Moyer. Good evening. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Nice to be back with you. It's been a few weeks since we've done this together. So uh, good to be uh, back in the chair with you. Yeah. yeah. And our, um, our special guest uh, returning after a really long hiatus and welcome to see him back um, joining us for a meaningful conversation that we've all wanted to do is uh, Shane the Ruiner. Welcome, my brother. Thank you, everyone. Good to, uh, good to be back. Good to be here with both of you. I love you both, and I'm looking forward to this. Yeah. This is actually yeah. the first one, we, the first show we've done all together. So. Yeah, it is, actually. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so this conversation goes back a number of months. It actually goes back. We've been kicking this around in the background for a long time. You and I have, Randy, yes. Yeah, and I met you, yeah. it's kind of been... <clears throat> it's kind of been held up by the fact that, uh, first off, it's a touchy subject, and secondly, uh, I think bringing Shane into this adds kind of a dynamic balance, and it also informs the conversation because obviously his own background and what he's revealed on the uh, Ruiner blog, and so it goes in an interesting direction. But we're gonna we're gonna kind of open it up in the first hour. Um, to kind of introduce the subject and fill it out a little bit about what sexual programming is, both inside of uh, programs, rituals, societies, covens, and um, how it operates and, and why it's important that we understand this. And it goes into the wider spectrum because it goes into group programming, societal programming, and things that are going on in the culture right now that are really important to understand and, and deal with in a very balanced way. So, as I said, this kind of initiated out of a conversation that Shane and I had, I guess, what, back in December, Shane? Yeah, I think that's right. It was around Christmas time. Yeah, yeah, you and I had pretty pretty long conversation, detailed, kind of delved into some of the aspects of um, Gender and sexuality as relates to um, having backgrounds in, in various various programs and various uh, occult organizations and what is going on in the culture right now. So we sort of started in a place where we were just noting how rapidly um, the landscape of sexuality has changed in the general culture and how it's impacted you know, us, obviously, on our own personal levels, and how this is playing out in what I think is both a wide-scale program to shift sexuality, but also what, in fact, may be an evolutionary process that's moving us into the, I guess, the androgynous aspects of humanity, which is goes into the the ritualistic occult influences. 
And uh, so maybe you can kind of uncork some of that. Well, I mean, there's a lot of cultural programming that goes into our sexuality, obviously. You know, if you want to start with Disney, yeah. if, you want, if you want to move forward from there, there's all sorts of media that, um, you know, Sex and the City, um, many other, you know, type broadcasts have, have definitely influenced us in, in a great deal of ways. And um, not all of those ways are necessarily beneficial to our mental health or beneficial to our sexual health or beneficial to our spirituality. And, um, you know, some of that does come from media and a lot of that does come from, you know, secret societies and, and, and cult programming. And um, it all plays a facet into our choices and our feelings and the way we react to things on a subconscious level. And uh, I always thought that was important for us to talk about. Um, I know I have been, um, for lack of a better word, a victim of that because of what I went through as a child and what I witnessed um, growing up through those programs. You know, I did witness a lot of rape. I did witness a lot of um, uh, deviance. And uh, our entire society is perver perverted which is a, a word that we typically associate with sex, which isn't necessarily a sexual word. You know, the word basically means to be, you know, taken out of context and put into a different light. And so um, I, I feel it's an important subject for us to touch on. And it's also a subject that I feel like, you know, this community, this alternative media community that we, we exist in, that off-planet radio exists within, um, tends to shy away from. They they tend to avoid. They don't want to talk about it, and that's that's because yeah. we're all really, you know, for lack of a better word, and I apologize for swearing, fucked up about it. And uh, I thought that you know, um, bringing us all together, you and I had a very good conversation about this. Uh, the three of us had a, a follow up, very good conversation about this. And I just I, I feel like it's something that you know, this community could, could stand to hear and could benefit from. So I'm, I'm happy we're doing this. I think it kind of uh, pivoted off of you and I talking and I sort of went into some personal aspects of my own background and the fact that I had publicly come out as, let's just being, let's just say being fluid sexually. And the revelation of that was done in stages, obviously, but it was also done purposefully. And I did that because I wanted to open the doors for exactly this type of conversation to occur. And that doesn't mean that people have to expose their own personal aspects. That's not everybody's path. In my case, um, I felt very strongly that because I had sort of lived in this cloistered identity for many decades and, and was dealing with that, that it might be useful for people to at least hear from somebody who even late in life is dealing with this, understanding that our culture is dealing with this. And so that kind of led us into one of my frustrations, which I think we all share, is that the alternative community is not dealing with these issues. Very few of them are. I'm aware right now that um, uh, our friend Mike Williams has done a show with Kara St. Louis on the subject. I have not heard it. Um, the, show, and, the show wasn't wasn't on particularly on that subject. It was about something else. But sure. in, in the middle of like about you know, two thirds or halfway through the show, because of the top how nutrition relates to some of these things that are going on in the the body, right? They got into a discussion about it that was actually a fairly sophisticated high level discussion about um, sort of the um, the possible evolution back to an androgynous state, which is what we come mm -hmm. from and which would be uh, sort of something being hidden from us, the sort of uh, disguising of that with this outward strange thing that's going on in the public with this, you know, sort of uh, movement that is distorting, uh, this distorted movement, right? And it was actually, a very sophisticated kind of conversation in terms of the kind that you and I had a couple of years, you know, a couple of years ago when we first yeah. started talking about this. And so I was glad to hear that. Um, but yeah, other than that, in general, 
you know, you don't hear too much of that. Uh, no, in general, the alternative yeah. media is a basically not dealt <clears throat> with maybe just light blushes on the aspects of sexual programming as relates to mind control mm -hmm. programs. It has not dealt well and it is not balanced at all on how it represents um, sexuality across the spectrum, recognizing that, you know, the numbers are shift, shifting rapidly. We're going to assume now that 10 to 15 percent of our population is non-heterosexual in some fashion. So those numbers are significant enough to me to indicate that we need to be in both inclusive and incisive about discussing subjects of, that that deal with this in a more inclusive way instead of making the assumptions that we're dealing with a, I guess, you know, a white straight audience all the time. And we know it's not white, but we also know it's not straight. And we also know that it's shifting rapidly, especially with what's, what's going on in the younger generations. I just heard a survey over the weekend, probably in a podcast, that indicates that Generation Z, which is, you know, the kids that are coming up now, are by leaps and bounds far more sexually fluid and non-reject and, and non-accepting of all of the traditional labels, including the gender binaries and the associations with, you know, monosexual relationships. So the tide is turning in two generations very quickly. And I think we all have experienced and seen this. And so it, it's, it's kind of pointing us that we now get to deal with it on a very real level. And it's like you said, Emily, you know, let's have the sophisticated conversation about this. Let's be open and real. Well, and where I'm coming from, I mean, most of the listeners will know my background. And so they will understand, you know, the rituals that I was involved in, the things that I've witnessed, um, the things that I've, I've gone through as an individual human. But at the same time, I mean, I, I have a transgender child, right? I have a child that was born female and now lives as a male. And so I, I do have something to say about all of that because yeah. I, I can see it from both the cultural programming to the genetic programming. To, mm -hmm. the, to the very simple us owning our freedom. Yeah. Yeah, that, in, that what you just said just now about genetic programming, I think is a really interesting thing and actually maybe a really good place to start because one of the things that, that I've become uh, real clear on in dealing with my own situation and talking to more and more and more of, of us or people who are, you know, who are like us, who are, or who think they might be like us, or whatever, right? Is that there's this, you know, we've been genetically tampered with, and one of the ways that we've been genetically tampered with is by having attributes of the opposite, you know, introduced, right? Well, let's just start with like genetically modified food, right? Right. So, how is a fetus developed? A fetus is developed within the womb based on what the mother is taking into their body. And if they are taking in a bunch of genetically modified materials, then the materials that are developing that fetus are also genetically modified. Yes. Right? And they don't have a gender. They aren't concrete male or female or whole or unwhole. They are completely, you know, askew. And so let's imagine this again. Um, from from a soul level and what we believe as incarnation so you as a soul decide i'm going to choose these parents i'm going to end up in that fetus that fetus is going to be that sex but then the genetics alter that sex the mm -hmm. chromosomes alter that sex so you can incarnate into a a physical body that you believe is female but somewhere during that inception they become male. And then what happens? You are born into a male's body that you believed was going to be female. And then you end up in the situation where you no longer have female parts that you intended. You have male parts that you did not intend. And that's where that idea of I've been born into the wrong body would start. Wow. 
Uh, and then something that Randy and I was ta were talking about the other day, we were talking about this idea that, you know, for some people, maybe many of their lifetimes, right, they've been uh, one gender. And then yeah. uh, in this, this, this lifetime may be their first lifetime being the opposite gender, right? And that may be b by the choice of, uh, I wasn't able to get it done as a, as a male. I want to incarnate as a female this time and get it done. Right, because that that, that is a like, definite other alternate factor. Is right, that, and you know and so, we will make that choice. Right, and then so, but then with what you're talking about, so one decides that they're going to come in as a female this time, or a, or a male, or the opposite of what they've been in almost every other lifetime, and then because of what you're talking about right now, you're talking about it as far as GMO foods, but. You know, I think maybe at the time that, some, that I or you were a child, Shane, GMOs weren't such a big thing. Of course, they were in development, but they weren't, you know, running the show the way they are right now. It was a little bit more uh, medically induced genetic tampering. So then, so you've decided to come in as a female this time, and then suddenly things are happening that are possibly introducing genetics of the opposite sex, even if not intended to change your gender, but in, intended to enhance certain attributes. So then you're now, it's a similar thing to what you're talking about you know, a slightly different perspective because you've, you've chosen to incarnate as something different for a specific reason, right? And then suddenly you're, you know, you're dealing with a, a buffet of genetic, uh, you know, stuff, right? Absolutely. And then you add everything that goes on within our society, within our culture yeah. onto that, where there, there is, you know, this gray area, right? There is this this bisexuality. There is this... Um, hermaphroditic, there is this transgender um, component to society that we all have to recognize as playing on our subconscious and playing and therefore translating into our conscious actions and attitudes towards things, right? So say for myself, you know, I, I was born in 1980. I grew up through the 80s. And yes, genetically modified foods weren't such a big issue. So probably I wasn't influenced influenced as a fetus however i was influenced culturally you know like who was a really popular you know in like 1978 like david bowie david bowie right and then boy and george Murphy. later <laughs> it's yeah. funny as soon as i named that name as soon as i named that year you knew what exactly what i meant yeah. david bowie right yeah. and that is an androgynous pop star that you know influenced all of us in some mm -hmm. way yep oh right? david and bowie was my role model growing i mean that was my that was my adolescence right there was was the emergence of david bowie well and, and it was profound because he was the first performer in the rock and roll generation that broke that male heteronormative role model and just jumped out of the bottle Right, and another person he worked with very closely was Freddie Mercury. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I love Freddie which Mercury. Is, yeah. Which is one of our first openly gay superstars. Well, and one of the very yeah. first superstars to have a, to die of HIV too. Well, and yeah. you also that had too. Mark, AIDS. Sorry, die of AIDS, not HIV. Yeah. yeah. You also had Mark Bolan of T Rex, who was very androgynous. Um, there was just this mo movement that was coming. That. You know, and I think he was he was on the cusp of it, although he always denied that. In fact, he denied the whole thing, but then later said no. He thought, he felt that was legitimate for his time, but that in the United States, the United States hated that. The fact that David Bowie came out and said that he was bisexual. So Bowie played ping pong with that thing for decades, and then it eventually dropped off radar, but... You know, even in his music, he did this, uh, he did the music for a BBC TV series called uh, Buddha of, The Buddha of Suburbia that uh, was very interesting. It was Naveen Andrews who went on later on to play in Lost. And, yeah. um, and Sensei. And, that, and Naveen Andrews' yeah. character plays a bisexual, urban, suburban, um, basically proto-hippie. In the, in, the, in the 70s. So, you know, there's this whole backdrop to it that's kind of in the culture. Absolutely. And if we look at, like I brought up Disney earlier, what Disney yeah. uh, effectively did was destroy the family unit, right? And, yep. and, and destroy the idea of, like, if you look at any of the Disney princesses, you'll find out they either have a mother, they have a father, they don't have both. Yeah. 
right? Yeah. And that is that is universal amongst, you know, the main characters, the princesses that we, we look at within Disney. And so that destroys the family, first of all, but it also leaves us gender neutral. It also leads us to a place where the, the mother can play both the mother and the father. How mm -hmm. many of us grew up in a single parent home where the mother or the father had to play both roles? Yeah. Right. And of course that influenced us. In course that, of course that caused an effect on society. And of course that plays into our sexuality. The other character that jumps into my head, and this is kind of like a personal icon, is Peter Pan. I was just going to say when he said Disney programming, always, Peter Pan, yeah. Always very ambiguous in terms of who, what Peter Pan was, but... And Peter he was played Pan, by Kathy Rigby. The, well, the gym. He played by Mary Martin, too. Uh, I was going to say, he, he's predominantly been played by females. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And here you have uh, Peter Pan, who basically comes in, abducts children, takes them off to Never Never Land. I mean, there's encoded in that, and this is not lost on me because as I've gone through deprogramming, I've realized there's a whole lot of coding there that goes into even MK Ultra type programming when you start to look at Peter Pan and, and how, how that's been rolled out of so, over so many generations and how ambiguous the character is and the plot line having to do with basically taking children and taking them into another world where their parents don't really exist. Well, we can even look at the most yeah. recent example of media um, using MKUltra, which is Stranger Things mm -hmm. and, and the character of Eleven. Yep. You, yep. Don't know, you don't know until they start calling her a her. That, that is a her. Right. She looks like a boy. She has a, a, a buzz cut. You know, there is nothing about her that tells you it's a her until they start calling her a her, right? So yeah. when, you're, when you first start watching that series, you're like, okay, this may be a little boy. This may be a little girl. I don't know. But then they start talking about being a little girl, and then that's when you get it, right? But I, I'm pretty sure that even within that series, there's a couple times where they're like, oh, I'm not sure if it's a boy or a girl, right? And, and that's because of how or what because the way her hair is cut, it's in a buzz cut, which is traditionally a boy's haircut, right? It's because of her reactions and she's not speaking. So therefore they don't hear the voice, they don't hear the expression, so they don't know, is this a boy or a girl, right? So they, even that in a very simple, you know, cultural programming type way through media, it tells you that that, that line is a little bit blurred today. And um, there's, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of reasons behind that, that, that go into cultural programming and goes into, you know, what all of these secret societies have been trying to achieve. And, but at the same time, it plays into our benefit because we as individuals, we don't necessarily need these denominations. You know, I live in a country where, um, you know, it's, it's been pretty well publicized that our gender um, denominations or our, uh, the, the gender roles are actually enforced by law. You know, I think we have like 52 to 56 of them at this point in time. Yep. And if I speak out against any of them, that's considered hate speech within the country I live in, which is supposed to be one of the most liberal countries in the world, you know. But at the same time, if I were to say, hey, sir, how are you? And that person identified themselves as female. I just committed hate speech. Where the only reason I've done that is they have long hair, they have breasts, they have the genetics of a female. And therefore, when I looked at them, I thought, this is a woman. However, if they want to view themselves as a man, I've actually just broken the law. And there's a, there is a you know, uh, a definite psychological impact of knowing that, knowing that I have to be careful if I call her a him or him a her, I'm actually committing hate speech. 
Yeah, we're kind of in this place now where we almost have to be very neutral in how we address people. Um, we're getting to the point where a new convention entered, entered into the culture is what are your pronouns? That's, that's something that's so new and so recent, but I've seen it in some of the groups I've been in where it is now very standard for somebody to introduce themselves by name and tell you their pronouns. See, this is the part that's so interesting to me is because we hear about all this stuff in the media, right? Obviously, I'm for people being whoever they want. I'm for, you know, the unique evolution of the individual into whatever they like to be, right? But I don't like the idea of compelled speech, as Jordan Peterson would call it, right? I don't like the idea of, uh, you know, law enforcing things with, you know, with law or even just with social persecution if you get it wrong. But what's funny is, is, I live here in Los Angeles. I'm part of like very underground music scene, right? I never come across this. I've never had the pronoun conversation come up ever, right? So, so sometimes I think that like something much more is being made of this in the media than actually exists in real life. Because I have, I mean, like I, 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 haven't, I, I just haven't come across it. And I have a very wide cross section of weirdos that I know and hang out with. So you'd think that this would have come up by now. But it hasn't. So are you, is this something, I mean, I realize, Shane, that your child is, you know, on the fluid kind of, you know, or is transgendered. But is this something other than in your immediate situation with your child that you're coming up against a lot? Oh, absolutely. You know, huh. like I, I, have, I have exactly the same outlook as you do where, you know, people can be whoever, the, whoever they want to be. Right? If they want to be male, if they want to be female, if they want to be him, her, or they then that's fine. The only per time I've ever personally bumped into a problem is where the, the gender neutral thing comes in. Mm -hmm. Because the, the pronoun for that is they, which translate down into it. And I personally have a problem with that. I don't want ah. to call someone an it. Yeah. Right. And so therefore, I, I'm looking for that he or she, because the other alternative is it. And I don't right. want the it, you know. And they may want the it, and in which case, I'm yeah. happy to give them the it, right? <laughs> but at the same time, my own, you know, my own heart and soul says that calling them an it demoralizes them. It makes them less than human. And I don't want that. If they don't view it that way, then I'm all for it, right? And so this all comes back to my own personal outlook on all of this is like people should be people. People can be whatever the... F how they want to be yeah you know and if they want to be male if they want to be female i personally do not care what parts they were born with i personally do not care how long their hair is whether they have breasts or whether they don't whether they have a penis or a vagina i really don't care that individual can decide who and what they want to be and i'm okay with that and i'm willing to accept that but at the same time don't persecute me if i make an assumption yeah. Yeah, well, it's, it, it's basically criminalizing assumption. Yeah. Well, you know, this is, I'll kind of play devil's advocate a little bit here, because I think it's extremism that's mirrored in the media and what's reflected in the media and even in social media, that there's an extreme edge to this that's insisting on the use of pronouns other than the traditional binary designations. You know, using using they, them, uh, Z, them, all these other new made up words, contrivances, we'll call it that. Yeah. So <clears throat> if you remember back in the period of the civil rights movement, at some point in time, things flipped incredibly. They had to because of the fact that we were pushing the boundaries of societal change at that time. So there was a hypersensitivity to how black people were being addressed. They did not want to be called Negroes anymore. And some wanted to be called blacks and Afro-American came into the lexicon, however stilted that is. But we had what was basically a redefinition of racial identities in that time that was very conflicting, very confusing, it obviously enraged a lot of people, especially the older generations. And I mean, I grew up around people who thought colored people were fine as long as they were cleaning their toilets. 
was shining their shoes, literally. You know, I, my grandparents were very elitist that way. So we're now in another redefinition cycle where on the front edge of this, we have very radical, very opinionated, uh, verbalizing activists, social justice warriors that are pushing this new gender redefinition into the lexicon. And in the course of that, and, and I have talked to people in the transgender community who have told me this is a work in progress. We still don't really know how this is going to work because it's so difficult to transact in everyday life. People who are active, actively, and Shane, I'm sure you know this, you know, with what, you're, which, what your child's going through, that transacting this in real life is very difficult given the number of people who still don't understand the issues or frankly don't even care. Well, let me tell you a story about that. My, uh, my kids grew up in a very small town. You know, and my my transgender child was literally the first transgender person to ever come out in their high school. And how did the high school react? They held a fucking assembly where they singled my child out and they said, this is a transgender person. And you will be punished if you talk negatively about transgender people. And how did the kids react? they would go to the edge of my kid's desk and they would talk amongst themselves about how the gross they thought it was for a girl to live as a boy or a boy to live as a girl. And they could get away with that because they weren't actually saying it to my child. Right. So that, that just shows you how society is actually dealing with this. It's not in a healthy way. They are singling those people out. They're making them feel like aliens. They're making them feel like lower forms of life. And of course, after being made to feel that way, they're going to act out publicly in some sort of way by creating a movement, by, you know, um, ensuring awareness, by, you know, protesting, taking a stand in any way they can to say, look, people are people and I just want to be a person. Can you please leave me alone? Yeah. And then there's all the other issues that go into it as well. And, you know, this is why I've sat down and talked to, you know, transgender, non-binary people is because I wanted to know what their issues were. And, I mean, I don't know what it's like in Canada, here in the United States, it's patchwork. But for the most part, people who are changing identities have difficulties with their documentation, with their legal status. Um, some of them... Uh, and I talked to one transgender who told me they could not get their um, their meds for a while. These were these were actually mental health meds that they were using. This wasn't HRT, the hormone replacement therapy, because of a conflict between their identity on their legal insurance forms and the fact that they were using a different identification in their personal communication as an example. So this is how complex this all is because it goes into, you know, the legal side of it, the societal side of it, the aspects of identity that we take for granted as, you know, what you would say, cisgender people. But in fact, there are a host of issues that go into this that the culture itself is still struggling to deal with. And so the front, the, 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 the front that we see as being the social justice warriors, the activists, and the spokesmen for the movement largely are echoing something very loudly that the culture doesn't completely grasp yet. And not only that, but there's such a, a huge load of contempt and prejudice that's, that's placed on this. Well, and um, this anecdote should kind of put it into perspective for the listeners is um, what I was told by a doctor at my local hospital when, when dealing with my own child in this issue was homosexual people, people who are gay and just like the other gender and want to be, you know, a woman wants to be with a woman, a man wants to be with a man. They fought very hard to make sure that this was not a mental health issue. Right? Mm -hmm. They fought very hard to, to, to ensure that. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas with trans people, they don't want to pick up that fight 
because at least in Canada where we have healthcare, right? A trans person can get their medication that allows them to make that transition right based because on it being a dysmorph dysmorphia, dysmorphia. Right? It, it is a mental health it is a health issue and therefore the health care will provide the medication for them because they need it whereas for a homosexual person they don't want that because they don't want that stigma of being mentally ill for trans people they're willing to maintain the stigma of being mentally ill because it allows them to acquire health care and therefore they get their pills for free they get the, the the testosterone or the estrogen for free they get the operation for a discounted price they get all of that at a discount or for free based on the fact that it's their mental health issue so that should tell you something in and of itself right is that it's not necessarily that trans people believe they have a mental health issue but at the same time, they don't want to pay for the transition. So maintaining the idea that it is a mental health issue allows them to acquire the transition without having to pay out of pocket for it, at least in my country, Canada. So I think I, I'm not sure because I haven't looked into this myself, but because of some of the conversations and discussions I hear about it, I think here it's a little different. I think here things are, they're trying to basically say that like, this is like a, um, uh, it, like a rights issue, right? Like this is not there. So it used to be that transgenderism used to be considered a mental disorder. And now it's like the, the, the push is for it not to be like the push, not, not I don't, it doesn't really have anything to do. I, I'm not hearing it. Like you're making this like a thing that like, okay, the, the gay and lesbian people don't want that. Like a, the classification under which most of this falls in the United States. And that's because we do not have a cohesive single payer well, uh, health health system. That here. is the difference. Is is healthcare in, it's a big in difference. Canada? We have healthcare, right? Which says, so here, which, which says that if you have a mental disorder, then our government will pay for whatever medication it is that you need, and therefore transgender people want to maintain it as a mental disorder. See, so that they don't have to pay for the hormones that they need in order to right. transition. I think it's different here because I hear people like uh, talking. So I think here it's a question of rights and not rights as opposed to that. So it used to be that gender dysmorphia or transgenderism was considered a mental disorder. And now apparently it is not so much. It's considered either like a regular health. It's, it's considered either a regular health issue or just a rights issue. Because I hear people like say, someone like Ben Shapiro, right? Talking about, you know, he has compassion for these people, but they have a mental disorder and they, they should be treated for a mental disorder. You know, like, so, so he's upset because it is not classified that way, right? So I think here, because we don't have, they would, they would like it to be, um, I think lots of people, including people who are just, Social, social justice warriors would like all of these things to be paid for regardless of how they're classified i don't know that there's a fight going on to keep it classified one way or another uh, well that's because obamacare didn't win right, right. If, Ob yeah. if obamacare had a one then everyone in the united states would be fighting just like everyone in canada is fighting to keep this as a dysmorphia because as a dysmorphia that's a mental health concern which falls under health care so in canada like my child's uh, uh, what is it, testosterone that they're taking, is paid for by our OHIP. Whereas in the States, that would not happen. And of course, because that would not happen, they have all the incentive to say this is a human rights issue as opposed to a health issue. So here in the United States, officially, because homosexuality, bisexuality, and other non-quote normative sexual behaviors were taken out of the the diagnost the psychological diagnostic manuals in 1975 you can't legally classify anybody having a sexual or gender-based um variance as mentally ill but what we do have is is a designation you mentioned dysmorphia we have um basically gender dysphoria which is a spectrum. And it, it's almost like the way they classified H, ADHD kids. Um, they basically, it itself is not a designation, it's a spectrum 
that embraces a number of other sub-disorders that includes anxiety and depression as being part of that spectrum. So where it gets encumbered into healthcare here in the United States is under health insurance policies and um, at, the, at the state levels where they're administering um, public assistance and public health, it gets encumbered under the mental care system largely as a result of, of launching into depression and anxiety. What's interesting here is that there are ways to get the HRT treatment. And one of the things that I learned very interesting is one is um, where you have community health care for um, low-income people, people who are on um, state subsidy, and Planned Parenthood is also doing this, which I thought was real interesting. Well, that opens a whole other can of worms. Of course it does. <laughs> yeah. I, say, I, don't, I don't know if you want. That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but it, it is, it is the mechanism it. by which a lot of this is occurring in the United States because of the fact that we don't have a cohesive health care system. So, Whereas we just... do. We do here in Canada, right? And I, I'm not going to mention any names and I won't name the hospital. But I, I had a very openly gay doctor from the hospital, my own child. And kiddo, if you ever listen to this, I love you and I'm sorry for using you as an example, but it's important to that people understand. And so I had a very openly gay doctor tell me that, that you know what? Homosexual people fought for years to make sure that this wasn't a mental health disorder. Trans people have been fighting to, for years to make sure that it is. And that all falls down into money. Is the transition costs a lot of money. You know, the operation, like, um, not that long ago, I hung out with a trans woman um, pre-op. So she hasn't actually had her operation yet. She was signed up to have her, her operation actually this month. And she negated it. And this will come into the conversation later. later. But she, she did decided not to take it yet because she wasn't in a spiritually proper place to go through the transition. Anyways, going back to that, that operation was about three thousand dollars out of pocket and was going to cost her nothing mm -hmm. because she had convinced her doctors that she had body dysmorphia and the only thing that was preventing her from suicide was having this operation and so of course my government stepped up and was like well here's three thousand dollars go have your operation don't kill yourself which is the humanitarian thing to do in my heart of hearts that's the right thing to do however you know, if, if being a homosexual is not a mental health issue, you're not mentally broken and that's why you feel that way, right? Because you're not, it's a, you know, it's a, it's, it's who you are, right? Being trans is also not, you're mentally broken and that's why you feel that way. That's who you are and you want to be who you are and you should have the human rights to be who you are. However, there's a price tag on that and someone has to pick up that price tag and that's where the rest of it comes in whether or not you're mentally ill because of being transgender or whether you're just want to be true you just want to trans you just want to become transsexual you want to become the opposite sex because that's what you identify with you know this is where the word choice always comes in people say it's a choice well, why can't it just be being who you are Right. Yeah, there's, I know, this really goes into some interesting quandaries. I'll just say this, that doctor that you're talking about is likely somebody that grew up in that first generation after Stonewall in 69. And the fact of the matter is, my life experience was, if you grew up in that generation, you understood that through the 1980s at least, even after they revised the, the diagnostic manuals and designations in the United States, homosexual people were treated as being mentally ill. And I can tell you, I went through therapy in my 20s and didn't bring it up that I was bisexual because I understood how that would get me labeled. So in a sense, what they fought for at that time was to remove that diagnosis as a mental illness and the perception of how a mental illness was viewed 
let's just say from the 1960s through to the 1980s in the Western world has changed remarkably as well. And there's a, I guess a whole spectrum that goes into ableism where we now understand that people have difficulties with aspects of their lives, but that does not necessarily make them disabled or what we classically called mentally ill. You know, we're defining that, we're redefining that kind of on the fly now. We understand the differences between functional and non-functional mental disorders and mental disorders that are organic and mental disorders that are a result of um, trauma or other external effects as well. So when we grant that somebody was born innate with a sexual identity, with a gender identity, then we remove that from the mental illness. But the effects of that, which are largely the result of the culture itself still coming to terms with these identifications, does in fact impact on the mental health of the people. So, you know, from that standpoint, I kind of see this as a two-edged sword. I appreciate what that doctor was stating because he's correct. Nobody wanted that designation who was, who was homosexual in that time. And I think what we're looking at now is a generation that's very cleverly found a way to kind of work the system, understanding that we're in different times and that we also have a much more flexible um, system of health care that's being funded socially, especially in Canada, and which I can, you know, even here in the United States, let's face it, on some levels, we have socialized medicine. You just have to be extremely uh, poor to get it. Emily, please. Um, yeah, no, I, the healthcare is, I mean, this whole thing, the way it is all wrapped in with healthcare is part of why I think there's, you know, so much mm, outrage on one side about this, the, you know what I mean? Like it is a messy space when you're dealing with the question of human rights or healthcare or mental, mental illness or whatnot, this idea kind of what you, you know, what you were talking about this person that, you know, that obviously from what it sounds like this person wasn't going to kill themselves, but saw that it's faster way to get what they want by saying that, you know, and then they're sure, you know, so there's people who are playing up the mental illness aspect of it. And then there are others who, you know, for whatever reason in their communities or in their families, they can't be who they are. And so they become very depressed or they become suicidal for, you know, they develop a mental illness that isn't really the same thing as whatever their sexual or gender issue is, but it becomes attached to it in a way that you can't really separate because of what they're experiencing. So you have sort of both sides of it. It's a really complicated issue. Um, and then, you know, it's, you know, what I always go back to is this, we live in this really weird, gross world where people feel the need to like identify in groups or identify as something that somebody else can easily understand and be comfortable with, which doesn't really leave a whole lot, lot of room for people to be their own unique individual self. And that, what I, that is what I think is really the answer to all of this. I mean, as long as we're trying to look at this as a rights issue or a health issue or a, whatever, all that kind of stuff, we're missing the point. And that is that, you know, evolution of the individual, right? In my opinion. Well, I'll start with two comments on that. One is just about mental health in general, mm -hmm. right? And, um, I live in a country where it literally takes you trying to commit suicide multiple times before you get any type of help. <laughs> you oh. know, it, wow. it's, really, it's really fucking disgusting. Excuse my language, but it's really disgusting. And I don't know what it's like in the States or, or any other country when it comes to that. But what I know is in Canada, the only point in time where you know, people will finally step in and say, okay, we'll get you some help is if you try to kill yourself. Wow. And that's, that's really sick. And that's really sad. I think and the, the other point of that is, is exactly what you're saying is I think all of it, all of it, you know, in Canada, we came up with 50 some odd gender denominations. How right. about we just boil it down to one, which is individual. Yes. 
right? Well, yeah, why don't human. we take it all away? Why do we add more? Why can't we just take it all away? Why can't we just say you're a human being and you have the right to express yourself however you choose right. to express yourself? And, what, and you and can have your name, right? Simple. You're Shane, he's Randy, I'm Emily. And that exactly. can be your own unique- That's not male, pretty. that's not female, right? Like we all yeah. understand, I mean, Randy and I both deal in audio where, you know, male and female is, is a typical term. Right. And, and what we're boiling that down to is the male sticks into the female and we don't need that anymore. I think we've grown up a lot as the human race since we came up with those terms. Right. Right. I think we've understood a lot more about sex and a lot more about being an individual than simply my part sticks into your part and therefore I'm the male and you're the female to be a little bit vulgar but at the same time very direct about it like because we we use that in electricity we use that in electrician terms we use that in plumbing we use that yeah. in so many different male, ways female, yeah right male to you do female, plumbing okay. you even have nipples i mean exactly yeah. right and so we're using all of these what are they biological reproductive organs in order to to, to determine what you are as an individual that's so messed up I have to stop myself from swearing in that case too, because that is so messed to. up. Okay, we already designated this. That is so this fucked isn't. up. You know, <laughs> just because one thing sticks into another doesn't make one male and one female. That's not yeah. how this works. These well, are human beings. These are souls. These are spirits. Yeah. These are individuals, and they can express themselves however they choose to, and they don't need your titles. And the fact that those of us who want to express ourselves in that way are actually fighting for more titles, we need to look at ourselves <laughs> in the mirror at that point in time and say, we don't need those titles. All I want to do is I am me and yeah. my name is Shane. And I chose like, whether I chose Shane or not, I I'm going to identify with at least my name or I can make up my own. My, That's my, what I kid, my, say my like, kid did that too. My, my what, oldest made up their own name. And they That's what I always say. I have a different name tattooed on my arm right now, right? And, and I'm cool with that. I don't care. I will get it covered up eventually, and I'm happy to do that. The fact of the matter is my, my kid gets it, is, you know what? I don't care about the rest of you. I'm going to be me. And my name isn't the name that my parents gave me even. It's this. And that's who I am. And I am a boy and I live my life this way and if you don't like it you can suck it <laughs> you know? and, and, and honestly that's the exact attitude we all need to understand especially About, within this community that is identifying themselves as souls and not the body anyways right exactly. and, but we, that's yeah. how we need to be really about almost everything right like like you know like this, I think one of the biggest problems we have is, you know, this group identities or collectivism and stuff like that, right? Whether it is this kind of stuff with sexuality or gender or whether it's race or what you're interested in or whatever, right? And, you know, we like, think about how many people just, you know, write you off as a conspiracy theorist, right? Or, or how whatever. many different genres of music there are. Right, you know, right. Instead Some of just genres, really good music, yeah. right? When, when somebody asks, like, what kind of music do you like? And I have to, and, and I have to give them like a term to describe it. It minimizes the music that I like. It makes it sound stupid. Exactly. So if I is. have to say yeah. I'm a he or I'm a she, I'm actually minimalizing who Shane is. Right. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this goes into the spectrum, you know, it, I'm not going to use the rainbow, but I'll use the spectrum here. <laughs> to point out that you know we just gosh we just did that the rainbow unicorn thing that um just to point you know that within the polar binaries the male and the female and i think this is where all these designations come from i think it's ridiculous to try to name them mm -hmm. we we function as human beings in a mixture of all of these things from the macho jock male to the very femmy sophisticated urbane lady femme boy we function in a spectrum that incorporates aspects of the male and the female because effectively you know it's one chromosome you 
you get the XY, you're going to be a male. You've got a double X, you're a female. But within that, that does not define the gender. And when we were kind of coming into this in the beginning, and Emily was, Emily and I talked about this, I think last week, when I said I had had a very amazing dream about two weeks ago, where it was kind of shown to me that I had never really incarnated as a male in this form. And it was part of the reason why I was struggling with things for so long. And it was, you know, it's a weird, it's a weird thing. It's a weird concept to think of. But I, I think in realizing that, I also think that we, we can function within the culture in whatever spectrum we need to, to survive, either psychologically, economically, or societally, politically. We don't need to attach more labels and convolute this. Well, that's, that's a very good point because um, I actually, uh, I spent a good amount of time with a doctor who at one point in time, his son is in the Paralympics for Canada. He used to, uh, he was one of the leading doctors in prescribing um, Asperger's in people. And after, you know, probably a good year of sitting next to this man, like three or four times a week, every week for that amount of time, um, he said, you know how you have Asperger's, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, uh, no. Mm -hmm. He's like, what year were you born? I said, 1980. He's like, yeah, you have Asperger's. You just were never diagnosed and you learned how to deal with it. And so you're extremely high functioning Asperger's mm -hmm. individual. And I, you know, I, I took it seriously because he, I respected him. He knows what he's talking about. Right. And I looked into it. I did my own research and I realized he's not necessarily wrong because, you know, I, I've had aspects of my life that have forced me in order to act the way that I do, despite the way I may feel in that situation. Right. And we live in a society now that that doesn't happen. You know, you are actually given the freedom to feel how you feel. However, you're not necessarily given the support to feel how you feel. So you're in this you know, dichotomy of just feeling crazy because you're told on one sense you can be whatever you want to be. On the other sense, you're told except for that. And, you know, that, that, that causes a schism in the mind where, where people are kind of becoming mentally ill in various ways because, you know, on one sense, you're told do what you want. On the other sense, you're, you're told, but these are the boundaries. And how do you react to that, right? You react exactly like this does, like we have in society today. What we're seeing right now, the, the premise of this conversation, is this not quite sure where we fit into because we don't necessarily fit into these very old parameters that were set, these very old boxes, right? And, you know, for someone like me, very much like you, Randy, I've always been very balanced between my male and female side, right? And in high school, that translated into be called, being called curly fag, mm -hmm. you know, because I had curly hair and I got along with girls. So therefore yeah. I was gay, yeah. you know, right? And, mm -hmm. and you know, and, and that's, that's, that's where we grew up. And that has now evolved into a place where all of us are now making the rules. So we're saying that that's wrong but no one's actually saying why that's wrong and what is the reason that that is wrong it's because it boils down to exactly what we were saying earlier emily is emily randy is randy shane is shane there doesn't need to be a mr a mrs or a they in front of that it right. can just be emily shane and randy and you know i get up some days and I feel different about myself and my expression of myself. It's not radical, but it's not unknown to me to put on eye makeup or paint my fingernails or wear clothing that you would call a little bit more general, gender, gender neutral. I can say that. And I will say likewise and continue. You know, it, if there was a time, you know, back in the, back in the late seventies when, I went out to clubs and quite frankly, you know, 
I could have worn a dress. I mean, because that was the cultural norm at that period of time in history. And would I have the done last it? I live, the last live show I played, I wore a dress. Yeah, yeah. So I, my, my experience is like slightly different in that like I've always really enjoyed being like a girl and, you know, and looking like a girl. Like I've never felt the desire to dress as a man or anything like that. But I, from the very time I was very young, was very good at things that boys are generally good at, right? And so I was, you know, I was a gymnast, which isn't necessarily thought of as a boy sport, but makes you strong like a boy. And so I was then good at the other sports. I would, you know, beat the boys at some of the games and, and things like that, which made me extremely unpopular <laughs> with both the boys and the girls. Um, you know, and then, uh, you know, I have a deep voice and uh, my mind just in some ways thinks about things and compartmentalizes things, you know, in ways that maybe are a little bit more masculine. I was raised by my father. My mom left when I was young. So I had a lot of masculine energy going on, even though I've always very much liked being a girl. I haven't ever felt, you know, like I wanted to dress like a boy or anything like but that. But you have but, a male, you have a, you have a masculine energy. Yeah. Right? And it's not overt. And you see, here's the thing. This is why I think we have to look at this as an evolutionary process, is that the second wave feminist Simone de Beauvoir said, a woman is not born, a woman is created. Now, you could say the same thing about a man. A man is not, you're not born a man, you're created. You are basically societally entrained into being what that image of a man or a male is at any given time. This is the, this is the whole Gillette uh, ad that ran on Super Bowl thing of toxic masculinity again. You know, are men, are males toxic? Well, hell, everybody's toxic at some level. But the point is, we're at a place in the culture where we're moving from these defined boundaries into a place where hopefully we would get to be sensitive enough to each other that we no longer needed all this artificiality, where somebody who's born as a female expresses for the most part is a female, but has certain masculine energies, whatever their preferences, whatever their expression, however they expose themselves to the cultural milieu, basically you accept that on the level that, oh, that's them. And, you know, I, I find that attractive. I'm neutral to it. I'm okay with it. But it's not a judgmental thing anymore. Humans express as humans. I might wear a green paisley shirt, and you might say that looks hideous. Um, and he would be right. No, just kidding. <laughs> kidding. I actually have a green paisley shirt. <laughs> of course I do. It's my favorite color. <laughs> but, the, but the point is that I do see this as something that's trying to push us away from all of these designations and into a culture where the individual actually is able to express without being condemned, judged, placed into mental health care systems, and having to go through uh, contortions in order to be accepted as the person they wish to appear to be. And so the, the forms right now, the gender forms, all of that are, are, are a mess. This whole thing's a gigantic mess on one level. It's a mess for the people that are going through it. It's a mess for the people that are experiencing on the societal level. And, and then there's also, and this is something, and this is something that I, you know, thought long and hard about and took me a long time to this come this this to come to this space. This is also hard for the people who don't understand this or yeah. who don't approve of this, right? Like and one of the things we also have to get through as a to as a society or people who are deciding that they want to live as unique individuals. We have to come to a space where we're going to be ourselves and we're okay with it if other people don't get it, don't understand, and don't approve. We okay. have to become on a certain level, you know, there's always going to be people like that. Yeah. And this browbeating that's been going on trying to get people to accept, accept you know, something that they don't is a waste, in my opinion, you know, a waste of time, but also not 
um, that they're where they are in their journey. Maybe where they are, they're, maybe where they're at is a sad spot. You know what I mean? Like, you know, what, or whatever with their, you know, having, you know, if they're unaccepting of others, but that's where they're at. And so, for, you know, and we're going to encourage people to be, you know, unique individuals. We also have to understand that there are some people that feel differently. Okay. And, uh, but I will draw the line here. And I do want to kind of close the loop on this so that we can get a pa Patreon segment. But um, where there is violence, and there is there violence, never be violence against differently gendered, differently sexualized people, um, it is unacceptable to me Absolutely. as somebody who was bullied and taunted and beat up over my perceived sexuality as a kid that an, generation after generation, there is an entitled class of people that feel they have the right to bully and negate the identities of other people. And this is well, why you get into the hate speech aspect of this, which I hate. I don't want that. I don't want to legislate speech, but I don't want to enable violence against minority people. Either. Well, violent, but, I mean, violence is different than speech. I don't see speech as violence. People are going to say what they're going to say. I think violence against other people for any reason other than self-defense is absolutely unacceptable, no matter what the circumstances are. Right? Well, you got to look at what the definition of violence is, mm -hmm. which is violating someone. That's right. right. So you can violate someone with words. With words, yeah. Right? yeah. And therefore, you can commit violence with words. I, and I, it is such a slippery slope. I, as, as a broadcaster, I don't want to regulate speech. On the other side of it, I'm in the social media realm where I see the extreme edge of this, and I see the aggressions that are launched against people who are perceived as different or people who are part of an underclass. Um, and it's, some of it's very subtle. And, and, and again, I don't legislating it probably isn't the answer. The answer is to make it intolerable, just as racism is intolerable, just as in, indignance against treating another human badly is intolerable. I, I, it, I agree with that, but I, at the I, I, same I, time, how do we ever get to that point without holding the people who do it wrong, do wrong accountable yeah. for doing I, I mean, wrong, right? For, and for, therefore, that's where hate speech laws come in, is they stop Nazis from being Nazis. Right. Yeah, and I, I guess for me, like, you know, when I find people who have aberrant ideas or behavior, I ignore them. I pay them no attention, right? And that's kind of how, like, you know, a lot of people who are out there doing ridiculous things and saying ridiculous things, they, you know, it, it, they're doing it partly for attention. So I don't... Where really, would they be without that audience if let's take the audience away? Hey, you're right. Yeah, so if, yeah. if people just start sort of, you know ignoring them or walking away from them to me the you know being shunned or being cold shouldered right is a more effective way than trying to browbeat them into agreeing with you or per or you know try and punish them for you know, their their thoughts or their their words or whatever to me just not giving them the attention that they're seeking is is the answer well it's it's no different than like you know <laughs> a group of kids playing dungeons and dragons if none of us are paying attention to their Dungeons and Dragons game, then, you know, if we're not posting it on the news, if we're not putting it in our newspaper, if we're not punching them on national television, right? <laughs> um, no one's going to care that those kids are playing Dungeons and Dragons in their basement. And, you know, we could, we could denominate or um, disempower any party to that by just not giving them any attention. Just like yeah. we wouldn't pay any attention to a group of kids playing Dungeons and Dragons in their basement. We can view the Nazi party exactly the same way if that's the way we choose. Like, you know, <laughs> the, most, the majority of the world does not agree with you. And you know what? None of us, instead of fighting you and saying, oh, that's yeah. so wrong, I need to protest. Yeah. How about, how about we just, you know, laugh at it yes. collectively? Yes laugh at it or ignore them you know like if it, you, you know whatever your position on it is aberrant behavior should you know don't encourage it and you know it's just like when you have a naughty kid right sometimes the more attention you give the kid the more they act up right so then you stop paying attention to them they usually stop well so they, what's the first thing they teach you to do in order to fight a demon is turn your back on it yeah yeah right don't give it any power don't <laughs> engage know? it yeah 
Well, I think we I think we barely scratched the surface, and yet at the same time, probably gave this a much more thorough treatment than it gets a lot of the times. And uh, so we want to kind of turn the corner here, and uh, we're going to do a, a Patreon seg segment as well. And uh, so those those of you hearing this on the public side of the broadcast. Um, Shane, tell people a little bit about what you're doing, what you're involved with, and whatever you want to let people know. Oh, damn. Um, <laughs> I, I, I have not done anything for a very long time. Um, That's actually this, an accomplishment. <laughs> <laughs> this is, um, in terms of uh, this realm. Um, on Wednesday, I'm going to record a video, and I'm probably going to post that on Patreon. And um, that that that's it. Um, Most people be... don't know that you have a Patreon. So yeah. So well, what, they'll find it if they want to find it. <laughs> I, I, I'm not even gonna. I'm not even gonna plug it. Um, hopefully, it'll post on Thursday. And then on Thursday, I'm gonna record something that I'm gonna put up on my YouTube channel. So um, that that's my plan. Um, I've I've been going through, you know, Shane world. Um, I haven't been able to pay any attention to much of this and uh now I, I don't have to deal with all of that so much so anymore so I, i'm in a place where i can i can finally focus on what my actual you know desire to help humanity you know falls under which is um i'll be i'll be talking to people more so um yeah you, you'll you'll hear more from me soon i guess i'll leave it like i and i still recommend that people go back and even though it's you know several years old at this point check out shane's blog the runer blog uh if you have you know if you're a certain kind of person with certain uh, with uncertainties about certain things that you're trying to you know figure out there's stuff there for you yeah. there are there there, there is yeah. information there that will provide the strings that you need to pull on if you're meant to pull on them. So I highly recommend that people who are questioning go over to the Ruiner blog and check it out. And for the rest of you, I'm sure you'll be entertained. Yeah. Yes. So. For people who this doesn't mean anything to, you'll at least find it entertaining for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, guys, we'll see you on the other side uh, over on Patreon. And yeah, that's it. We're out. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. This is Off Planet Radio.